Hey everyone, Fox here from modelmaking.guru and welcome to the first part of a simple painting guide I'm filming for my very good friends over at goblingaming.co.uk, your one-stop shop for all your tabletop gaming needs. In all honesty, they don't actually know I'm filming this for them, I'm just kind of doing it, so I guess it's like kind of guerrilla contenting or something. Anyway, let's crack on and have a look at what I'll be painting today. Yes, I'll be showing you how to paint a Warhammer 40k Orcs Waz Bomb Blaster Jet, a fab kit that allows you to build four official variants, or really any number of cobbled together variants you can think of. The beauty of Orc Tech is that it's cobbled together from scrap, so really you could stick all kinds of stuff on the base kit and just go to town. For this build, I've created, I guess, a sort of Wazbomb Daka Jet. I had to put the huge ass intake thing on the hood though, that's a legal requirement. The smaller intake would just be nonsense. Over the next two or three videos, I'm going to show you an easy and straightforward way to paint this model so that it looks kick ass. Now, don't worry, if you're not an experienced painter or out, I'm not going to show you Golden Demon level skills. Rather, I'm going to use some simple, basic methods that anyone, even beginners, can easily use to achieve a good paint job without it looking like it's been painted with a dead cat and half a potato. So, let's crack on. As you saw back there, I've not fully assembled the model, I've left it in sub-assemblies to allow easier painting of some parts like the cockpit, the figures and air brakes and so on. This is always a good idea, never leave yourself with bits you can't get at to paint. With the sub-assemblies ready, I started the first step which is priming. Now, no matter what model you make, no matter what products you are using, the first painting step is always, always priming. Paints are not designed to just adhere well to smooth plastic, metals or resin, but primers are designed for just that task. So before you get paint on your project, get it primed. If you don't, you risk the paint being easily removed, more on that later, and also I will come round and point at you with the finger of shame. Also, every time you paint without priming, a kitten dies. Now, you can see here I'm applying my primer with an airbrush. Now, if you don't have an airbrush, don't panic. Primers can either be applied by airbrush or by rattle cans. Either is fine, although ideally airbrush primers are easier to control. Also, you can use airbrush primers indoors with a respirator and spray booth, obviously, whereas rattle can primers must be applied outside. Never, never use a spray can indoors as they're effectively paint hose pipes and also horribly harmful. Either way, get your primer on the model slowly and carefully. Build up the primer layer in thin, misted on coats. Don't just blap a thick coat on all in one go. That leads to runs, to blobs and loss of tiny details. Now, I'm using Ammo of MIG one-shot primer here, but as you'll see later, it went horribly wrong and caused problems, so I can't honestly recommend it to you. Instead, I suggest either Badger Steinal Res or Ultimate Modeling Products Ultimate Primer if you have an airbrush, or Tamiya Citadel, which is Games Workshop, or Army Painter Primers if you're using rattle cans. Also, note the colour. I will be painting red on this model, so I've chosen a light coloured primer specifically. I'll explain more about that later. Once the primer coat has had time to cure, I go in with Viejo Model Color German Camouflage Black Brown. This is what's called a pre-shade coat. The point of this is to effectively low light any panel gaps, recesses and areas that I want to look a little darker when the base color goes over the top. Now, if you're using rattle cans and not airbrushes, I'm afraid, sadly, there is no real way to achieve this effect without an airbrush at this stage. There are ways to get similar effects later, and I'll talk about those, but for now, you're going to have to ignore this step. You'll see I'm not being neat or careful here, it doesn't really matter. This layer will be mostly covered up, and as long as it creates darker areas, it'll be fine. I have chosen the dark brown colour specifically because I'll be painting red and a traditional black pre-shade coat will look too dark and obvious. When pre-shading, thin the paint to a little more than normal and drop your PSI a tiny bit so that you can get close up to the model to apply finer lines. You'll need to wipe the needle tip off more frequently though as the blowback from being so close to the model will dry paint out on it more often. 
With the pre-shade coat done, it's time for the first main base colour, Viejo Game Colour Bloody Red. This is a lovely, deep and bright red colour. Now, like with the primer, this needs to be applied in thin mist coats, slowly built up to be bolder and more opaque. Keep going until you arrive at the depth of red that you like. As you build up the colour, keep an eye on the pre-shade layers. You want to use the paint's natural transparency to allow the pre-shading to show through very slightly, to create shadows around the model. This artificially gives the model depth and realism, and stops it looking flat and lifeless. Also, note that the transparency of the paint is specifically why I chose an off-white primer colour. Reds, whites and yellows are notoriously transparent. If I'd primed in black, it would show through the red, making it appear darker and less vibrant, and it would take more coats to cover up. Again, if you don't have an airbrush, you can simply brush paint the colour on. It'll leave you with a flatter colour as you'll not have been able to pre-shade, but we can work on that later. Keep in mind also that if you have rattle canned your primer coat, you can use a coloured primer to do the primer coat and the base coat all in one go. For this model, for example, you could simply prime with Citadel Mephiston Red Spray Can Primer and have gotten here a lot quicker. Once the base colour coat had dried, I added a tiny amount of Viejo Game Colour Sun Yellow and Viejo Game Colour Dead White to the Bloody Red, and applied this as a highlight coat to the centre of panels. This is applied very, very lightly, you may not even see it on camera here, and very slowly, to create a central highlight area that's in contrast to the low light pre-shading I applied around the outside of the panels. Adding yellow as well as white to the red stopped it becoming a pastel pink highlight. If you don't have an airbrush, you can still do this highlighting step by dry brushing very gently with a very soft brush and using very small circular brushing motions in the centre of panels. This will allow you to get a hint of post shading to get a, a similar contrast effect to the airbrush version. With the highlights done, I then masked off and painted a few darker panels with Game Colour Heavy Charcoal, and then, in the centre of those panels, added a highlight of Heavy Charcoal with a little model colour white added. Once this was done, I started to remove the masking, when suddenly... <sighs> it seems the ammo primer betrayed me. As the masking was removed, carefully, I saw spots of bare plastic because the tape pulled the primer up with the paint on top of it. This was caused by the primer not doing its one single job, i.e. adhering to the plastic. I've not used the ammo one-shot primer before, and in all honesty, I won't again where masking will be required. I'll instead rely on the other primers that I mentioned earlier. Now, if this was a shiny sports car or a motorbike kit or something like that, this would be the end of the project, only fixable by stripping the entire model and starting again. However, luckily, this is an orc vehicle made of scrap and found bits and string and the occasional unlucky squig that couldn't get away fast enough. So there's an easy solution. Mechanical violence. A perfect way to hide this horror is to simply make it into battle damage which will look fab on an orc vehicle. So I took my pin vise and then my trusty mini not actually a dremel dremel and added some anti-aircraft flak damage. This can be painted over later to look like paint chips or bare metal and actual damage and no clue of this heresy will remain. With that now taken care of, I moved on to hand painting the remaining details around the kit to get it ready for decals and weathering. First, I tackled the exhaust manifolds. I wanted to give them a, a classic rusty look, and we can start that look at this stage with a few simple colours. Don't worry, the airbrush has gone away now, it's all brushy brushy from here. 
I started by basing them in a coat of Citadel Rhinox Hide. It's best to work dark to light when doing rusts. Now, when brush painting, the golden yet counterintuitive rule is to use the biggest brush you feasibly can. A big brush with a fine point can paint wider strokes when needed and also holds much more paint and needs to be refilled less often than a tiny, tiny brush, leading to less brush stroke marks in the paint job. Use a wet palette to make sure your paint is thin just a tiny bit, never apply it from the pot, and like airbrushing, apply multiple thin coats rather than one thick coat to ensure a smooth finish and no loss of fine detail. Then I applied a quick wash of Citadel Null Oil to the exhausts to make the recesses pop and give it some depth. Citadel shades are effectively transparent paint washes and are designed to tint the surface a little and then settle in the recesses. Just brush this over with a big brush and make sure it doesn't pool up anywhere. When that dried, I then carefully applied lighter colours in a patchy, blotchy pattern with a mixture of dry brushing and stippling, starting with Citadel Mournfang Brown. When dry brushing, remove most of the paint onto a piece of kitchen tissue to leave only a tiny amount on the brush. This way you can build up soft, subtle blends and transitions. Then I applied Citadel Scrag Brown. And lastly, Citadel Tau Light Ochre. Note how I went from dark to light. Next, it was time to tackle the metallic areas. I painted the guns with Viejo Metal Color Gun Metal Grey. The metal color range are by far the best, smoothest and most grain-free metallics you can buy, but they are very, very thin and runny, so can be applied neat. As with all metallics, never use a wet palette for these. Instead, use a dry surface instead. Not that you need to thin these at all anyway. For the forward half of the main engine, I used metal colour steel. For the aft half of the engine, I used metal colour pale burnt metal. For the other smaller details around the craft, I used a 50-50 mix of pale burnt metal and steel. The next bit to tackle were the interiors. I like to use the classic World War II zinc chromate coated metal look. So I started with Citadel Elysian Green. Zinc chromate was plated onto bare aircraft interiors to protect the metals within, and I like the effect a green interior gives to aircraft. 
This was applied inside the cockpit, in the rear gunner pod, to all the spars, stringers and conduits inside the wing and the rear air brake hatches, and also on the inside faces of the air brake panels. Next, because they'll be hard to access once the air brake panels are attached, I had to weather up those recessed areas now rather than later, so they were all given two coats of Citadel Agrax Earthshade Shade. Once dry, I gave the wing and fuselage air brake recesses an extra coat of Citadel Norm Oil Shade for extra and slightly oily looking depth. Now, I interpret all the avionics in these bays as either conduits, sort of thick rods, or wires, the thin ones. So, whilst the rigid conduits were left as green, I decided to make the wiring black. Now, I found that rather than just using black paint, building up multiple coats of Norn Oil shade, the shades being basically transparent washes, gives a nice rubbery or plastic look. So, I applied, I think, from memory, six coats to darken them up. The penultimate area needing a base coat is the cockpit instrument panel. I wanted a, a black panel with silver trim, but again, instead of just painting it black, I used Norn Oil to get a nice metallic edged black look. First, I went for a base of 50-50 pale burnt metal and steel. Next, I went in with the Norn Oil all over the panel except inside the dials to keep them silver. About four coats of Norn Oil darken the panel just right, with a hint of the silver shining through the edges for that painted aluminium look. This technique also works brilliantly on bolter casings. When this had dried, although the raised details were perfectly clear, because the shade doesn't cover them, I picked them out along with the dial interiors with just pale burnt metal to make them really pop. Lastly, I used two technical paints and one glaze to accent the buttons and the dials. For the buttons, I used Citadel Waystone Green and Citadel Spirit Stone Red, using them neat from the pot. And for the dials, I use Citadel Lamenta's Yellow Glaze, a wonderful glaze that sadly is no longer in production. And now you can only find it on eBay for silly money, but you can imitate it just about with yellow added to a glaze medium at a pinch. The beauty of these three paints is that they are transparent and the shiny silver underneath shows through, making them bright and bold. Lastly, the pointy things on the dials were picked out with Citadel White Scar. The final two base coating steps for this episode at least were to darken the front nose cone cowling and to paint the teeth. For the cowling, like before, rather than just paint this black I wanted a, a hint of the red to show through, so instead applied several coats of Norn Oil, being careful that it did not pool up anywhere. And lastly, the teeth were picked out with the 50-50 pale burnt metal and steel mix from before. Note that the Norn Oil layers and the metal teeth layers are not super neat. There are many ropey edges on the model so far, but this is fine. I know what weathering is to come, and much of that will hide any little errors, mishaps or wonky edges. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
And with all that done, this is all the base colours applied and we're ready for the next steps in the next episode. Next time, I'll show you how I did the black and white checkers on the bombs, how to apply decals and how to mask and paint the canopies. You'll note here how I've painted the pilot and the gunner. Sadly, I couldn't film that as they're just too small for me to film effectively. But I'm sure that I'll show you how to paint orcs in a future tutorial, so don't worry. But until next time, we shall leave it there. Remember to visit Goblin Gaming at the link in the description below the video to pick up this awesome kit and all the stuff you need to make it look fabulous. And don't forget to like and subscribe and stay tuned to Goblin TV for more from the kick-ass gang of ne'er-do-wells at Goblin Gaming, your one-stop shop for all your tabletop gaming needs. Adios amoebas!